Kia ora, um, ko Tom Beeston toku ingoa, kei te mahi ahau i tāmaki pāinga hera. Um, my name's Tom Beeston, I work at, here at Auckland Museum in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I'm going to talk to you about a case fit out we've been doing, which involves a leatherback turtle shell floating through a sea of rubbish. Um, like anything, um, a lot of people have been involved in this um, and there's a lot of ideas and stuff come into it. Uh, but for some reason, as the maker, I've been allowed to take the credit on this occasion. Um, so the case I'm talking about is for a gallery with a working title of Learning Base. Um, is the gallery is designed to act as an entry point for school groups. Um, so it's really an introduction to the whole museum collection. Um, there's a broad variety of objects in there, which is to inspire curiosity about connections between objects where you might not expect there to be connections. The, um, and the scale of the objects, they've chosen large objects and these four cases are really large cases and that's deliberately to inspire curiosity with the use of spectacle. So I'm, I'm talking about one of these four cases. So the rubbish for this case was collected from the same beach where the turtle shell was found. So the connection here is obviously quite real. Um, and the aim was to make the turtle appear to be swimming through this rubbish as if it was in the sea. Um, so the brief for us down here was essentially to make a mount for the turtle shell and a mount for about 350 pieces of rubbish. Um, while the rubbish is not collection items as such, they were collected and they are <coughs> therefore one-off and the same sort of care will be needed in the mount making. So the ideal scenario was to make the rubbish appear to be the surface of the sea um, with minimal mounting structures visible or obvious. So one idea that was floated for this was to use fishing net and somehow make that rigid and be able to support the rubbish. But that idea was ditched because it introduced fishing net as a whole another concept that wasn't really helpful in the story they were trying to tell. Um, another idea that I quite liked and took quite far was to use straight mounting rods and make them appear like shards of light shining through water. Um, I took this, this idea quite far and um, actually had a CAD file ready for CN, five axis CNCing a base panel to support the rods at the right angle and then all we'd have to do is know the length and cut them to the right length and that would they would all meet at the surface and then they would be quite nice points to mount the rubbish. That idea was ditched because it was seen as a bit too much of a spectacle in itself as compared to the objects. Um, so at about the same time the developers decided that there would be a theme across all four cases of having sculptural elements made out of laser cut stainless steel. Um, in this case, the, that sculptural element would be the, the surface of a wave. So the production manager, Nick Shah, um, drew up the 3D form of that wave in um, CAD software. Um, and so everyone was happy with the wave he drew. So that's the form I've been working with through this project. I looked at lots of images of surfaces of water, oceans and seas and such, but the, to, with a view to finding something that you could turn into a image that you could cut from a sheet and that would represent water. What I actually ended up using was images of swimming pools. Um, while they're, that's sort of still water, <coughs> it actually presented an image that you could cut and was still very suggestive of water. Um, it also gave quite
quite a nice mesh pattern that you could scale and we could adjust the holes to a degree to suit the rubbish that we were expecting to mount. Um, and the other advantage I thought at the time was that you could make it quite a thin mesh and that would allow it to be formed to a compound curve that we had as the wave. As I went along I decided that that was probably not the best approach. It needed to be strong enough to support itself. So what we would have to do is actually to come up with a two-dimensional net shape that we could cut into the, the ripples pattern and pull it back together with cut darts into it, pull it back together, and that would form the, the curved dome of the wave. Um, I drew the ripples, or traced the ripples up in um, a 2D vector software um, and then I introduced the, the shell into that drawing so that I could see how it might interface with the water, um, morphed the ripples to look like they were flowing around its edges a bit more and then actually created an opening in the kind of upward sweep of the wave where the tail would be actually physically interfacing or tucking in to the wave. Unfortunately, our collective skill set on the CAD software didn't stretch to unfolding a three-dimensional di three curved shape. So um, I took the approach of card and paper, um, made, some, made some upright formers out of card from, derived from the CAD file so that I could lay the paper over that and then cut darts into the paper until it came together over that form and sat nice and comfortably on that former. So I then scanned that piece of paper um, into uh, a well-known photo editing software, took my ripples pattern and smudged it to fit that uh, net. I also used this smudging process to stretch the mesh pattern where it crossed over the dart openings so that um, when it came together it would fit better um, and then I had to retrace that in the vector software and then I actually cut the darts out in the vector software but carefully brought the made sure that when it, brought to, it was brought back together the flow in the ripples pattern was still there it didn't have jagged uh, joints at this point I also made the joining tabs that would pull uh, all the parts together. Um, so I extracted these from that same drawing, keeping the holes all nicely lined up so that there wouldn't be any problems getting, once they were threaded for the little stainless steel nut, uh, bolts. This then needed to be tested at small scale and um, I decided the easiest way to do that was actually to 3D print it even though it's a 2D um, object being folded into 3D um, it gave a nice flexible um, material that could kind of represent the 3mm three, the three stainless that it would be um, and it saved a lot of cutting basically. We broke the, or separated the mesh out into parts to make it more convenient for assembly when it was at full scale. Um, and these parts, once I, I scaled them down to one sixth size and, that, and they fitted nicely onto the bed of the printer. And so that's the scale I went with for the scale model. Um, so once this sat nicely over the formers and seemed to come together nicely, it wasn't seemed to be any other way of testing it. So we pressed ahead and ordered the stainless. Um, once at full scale, I used um, the 12 mil MDF as the formers spaced out across um, the base panel dimensions um, and then got to work wrestling that 3 mil stainless steel onto it. Uh, we used wrenches and clamps to try and bend it to shape and the occasional hammer and it seemed to just be coming together there was just one bit where it couldn't couldn't quite get it to come together and used a, 
actually ordered a longer joining tab and a little infill tab, but everywhere else it seemed to work nicely. Um, and once it came together and we bolted the uprights on, which had the correct angle at the top, it all seemed to be nicely self-supporting. Um, so we raised it off the formers by about 50 mil, just enough to give us room to mount the rubbish um, with the occasional cutting away. But um, we wanted to keep the formers there so that we could use that structure as a support when we were moving it around the galleries to take it to the gallery eventually, because we'd need to tip it on its side to fit it through doorways and such. So then it was time to start mounting the rubbish. Um, as I said, we were aiming to have the, the surface cutting through all the rubbish at what we imagined would be the floating level. Um, I did a small test of this just to make sure the approach was going to work on similar kinds of rubbish. Um, but once it came to the, doing the final thing, there was only kind of one shot. So I was working to a uh, layout of the rubbish that the curators had done. Um, and I had a photograph of that layout with my mesh superimposed on it to work to. Um, it was a bit of a bit of a process, but as you can see from this video, I did it all in about a minute. No, it was more like four weeks with all the usual distractions of working in a museum. Mostly it went well. Um, at the beginning, I could have done some of them better, but um, each object pretty much needed a new approach because they were all so different. Um, but it seemed to go quite well. I'm quite pleased with how that came out. As you can see, there's quite a range of interesting bits and pieces among the rubbish. Um, so I had some fun deciding how they might float and um, where to cut them. Um, a few kind of local and international brands represented there, which was interesting. Um, and whether to show that or not, but we just went with whatever it was and whichever way it seemed to be happy floating. Um, the glue we used was called Paraloid, which is um, acrylic dissolved in acetone. Um, it's got quite a nice user-friendly drying time and once gassed off it's conservation friendly. Um, and supposedly it's completely reversible, probably depending which plastic you're gluing, but fortunately that didn't eventuate. I didn't need to test that. Um, we wanted some objects to be floating subsurface or mid-water. Um, so I used kind of monofilament and threaded some steel through some things to make them hang, but not just be hanging down in space. Make, make them look like they were floating. Um, <clears throat> so the form has allowed us to move it around, but what we need to get it into the case, we made a stretcher to pick it up from the tops of the uprights and spread the load nice and evenly so it wouldn't deform when we pick it up. And that would allow us to slide it in using a forklift slide it into the short end of the case, which is the, the door, um, and just drop it and we can guide the uprights into their holes in the base panel. <coughs> it would be nice to show you the finished thing, but unfortunately it's not installed yet. And it's pretty busy here, so I don't think I can ask enough people to get the turtle shell out and mount it. Um, so you just have to wait and see, I'm afraid. Um, the best I can do is this image we took when we assembled everything to check that it would all fit together. Um, that was a while back. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening and um, look forward to your questions. Ka kite anō. Hi Tom, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I first want to say how um, great the title of your talk is. Uh, it's very poetic. Um, and at the end of the day, it is literally rubbish around a turtle. Um, yeah. Very cool project. Um, 
I have a question for you first. Let me just pull up the, the Q&A thing. So I, I'm wondering if you had any, it's more of a design question. I'm wondering if you had any discussions around um, um, coloring the structure, um, um, make yeah. it more watery, or what was, was your little... choice of leaving it as raw aluminum? Um, your stainless steel, was... sorry. Yeah, no, there was a lot of discussion. Um, I'd sort of touched on a few ideas that went like the, the idea of using a fishing net as that surface. Um, and then I talked about the, the shards of light kind of idea, but um, the stainless had always been an idea that was there in the background and different potential different ways of doing it with stainless, not necessarily that final idea, but um, eventually when I did <coughs> mention this, they there's that whole suite of cases and they decided that they needed something to tie all those together visually and this idea of kind of sculptural stainless steel came up and um, it was widely supported and so we developed we kind of channeled this problem down that route and this is what we came out with um, yeah so there's other there's like um, a tree bark representation that we've done which is Coralie trees, which are quite well known, New Zealand tree, um, and that's telling a story about whale, whales and trees, a kind of myth, uh, a Maori myth. Um, uh, what other ones? Oh, and there's another wildebeest case, a case with a wildebeest in, and we've used the stainless steel to represent the, the dried up earth that it might be standing on. So it's, yeah, they've tied it in this stainless laser cut stainless steel appears in all four cases. Great. And uh, we have attendee that's kind of chiming in and saying that water is, is a very tough effect to capture. And you said the light shards were next. Um, but was there talk of using gallery light in other ways to, to give a water effect? Uh, there will be gallery light adding to this. Um, it, it will just be over the top. Um, they're using, I can't remember, Wayne the uh, man, but is it a moving gobo kind of thing to accentuate that kind of gentle ripple of water? So we will be using gallery light to aid it as well, yeah. And I'm wondering, um, so before you started this project, was the rubbish collected? Like, did you know what trash you were working with or? Um, yeah. you Kind of integrated um, it after? No, it was there the whole time I've been working on it. It was collected by um, a, a not-for-profit called Sustainable Coastlines who campaign against kind of plastic getting into the ocean and such and they quite often do litter picks and this was um, the rubbish collected from one of those litter picks. Um, so it was there all the time. It was kind of wrapped up safely, double bagged, for quite some time before we got round to deciding how it was going to be cleaned, because it's obviously in the same case as a collection object. So um, we knew we had an idea, and I'd looked at it, and it was, you know, had an idea of roughly, you know, basketball being the biggest thing, and there were lots of bottles, and then lots of people, um, bottle lids and straws, and so I had an idea of the scale and the type of object as I was developing it. Um, something else I was going to say then, but I've completely forgotten. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so and then and then some stuff out of that collection of rubbish did have to be picked out because the conservator was wary of kind of plastic degrading and both it just not existing, <laughs> it, um, and also the gassing off potential of some plastic. So yeah, it's not. Mm -hmm and so you for this project you worked um with this eco group um you worked closely with the curator can you talk a bit about like the kind of collaborative practice towards i mean the mount is really what kind of ties together this piece right could yeah. you talk about the collaboration a bit 
well, there's there's all sorts. I mean, um, there's a. I don't know if I'd call myself a mount maker. I've come in. This is I've been at this museum for two and a half years, and before that, I had no idea about mount making. Mm -hmm. um, the, so the mount for the turtle was made by a colleague Chris Sheehan, um, and he collaborated with another colleague to do the three D scan. They actually three D scanned the inside of the skin to develop a mount. Um, so. And then, yeah, to come to this design outcome, it was really, it was curators, um, exhibi exhibition developers. It was just, yeah, quite a, quite a collaborative process and it was quite slow. You know, I was working on lots of other things. This was trickling along as ideas for quite a long time before we actually got stuck in and went with this idea. So yeah, lots of meetings. <laughs> um, the sustainable coastlines were before, that was all done before my time. So, I mean, I don't know how long this uh, gallery has been in development, but um, just the idea of combining the turtle shell with the rubbish was before my time. That was, okay. uh, yeah. And so we have a few questions from Karen. Um, who is asking, um, once this is installed and open, how long will this be on display? And she is also asking how the turtle shell is being supported. Uh, okay, so uh, it's um, 10, I think it's 15 years they're aiming for with this display. Um, and I don't know if the shell will have to be rotated out over that time for you know, light exposure purposes. I'm not actually sure about that, but the the whole thing as a whole is has a 10 year, oh, sorry, 15 year life expectancy. It'll probably be there longer than that. It's, a, it's definitely a permanent gallery. Um, and yeah, supporting the turtle, that was not my job, but, but I can talk about it. They, they, yeah, they scanned, they took a scan like the previous two our presenters would have done and derived um, sections from that scan to make um, ether foam uh, ribs along along its length, and then that's supported on a on a panel, and then there's just a single um, upright rod onto that, so that we can pass it in and drop it down. So that will go in after the rubbish wave is installed into the case. We'll will then put the mount in place and then we'll be able to offer the turtle shell onto that mount. So yeah, there's quite a lot of discussions about process and order we were going to do that. I don't know if that answers enough about supporting the turtle shell. Yes, and Karen says 15 years, wow. Um, <laughs> long time. Yeah. So we have another question from an anonymous attendee who says, thank you. And um, goes on to say, you might have mentioned, but were you given free license to arrange the garbage? There were a lot of colors and shapes, the pieces hanging down. It's funny how much effort can go into making something look random. Yeah, that's, um, no, that was another meeting was had. Um, <laughs> to arrange the rubbish and there was, there was five or six people there um, and an idea sprang up at the time to arrange the rubbish roughly in color like a rainbow and that somehow that idea stuck um, as a way to kind of they wanted to make it look more attractive uh, what's the word there's a way to draw the eye really so it didn't look too kind of brown and you know mm -hmm. so it stood out more so yeah the rubbish was actually arranged randomly but in roughly color-coded arrangement and so I did have a photo of that that I was working to while I was um, mounting all the rubbish I had to get it roughly I mean they weren't too fussy about it but roughly in, in places there that we'd agreed on so there was no of arguments after it happened. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
And so we have um, a couple more questions coming in. Uh, one from Helene, who also agrees this is such a nice project. Um, and she's wondering how high up in the display case will the wave be? Will the bolts be visible, mainly for children, or did you hide them somehow? I guess concern for children. Um, no, the bolt. You mean the the countersunk bolts that hold the, the thing together? Yeah, they'll be visible. So it's it's kind of the top, the highest point is about a meter, um, and the lowest point of the wave is about uh, four hundred off the off the ground, but off the base it's about two fifty, I think. Memory. Um, so you can. As a child, you'll be able to see underneath it and above it without having to bend down. Um, as an adult, you'll be able to see underneath as well. Um, so yeah, we didn't attempt to hide the bolt um, and the bolt head is on top of the uprights as well. The uprights will be um, matte black, so they'll sort of disappear a bit was the aim, but yeah, it's not really an attempt to hide anything. Just make it tidy. Great. A lovely work. BJ, um, how are we doing for time? I think that pretty much, um, I think we've used our, our yeah. question and answer time. Tom, this was a great presentation and a fantastic example of how to utilize uh, 3D technology, not only in the design aspect, but prototyping and working out the different aspects of the display. Really, really good stuff. Thank you so much.